Hello, everyone, and welcome to our sixth annual BIA Orange County Women's Conference. I'm Allie Wolf with Myers Research and your chair for this event. Myself, along with my co-chairs, Joan Webb, Valerie Hardman, and Lisa Parrish, the wider committee, and of course, Laura Barber and the BIA of Orange County are so thankful you are joining us this morning virtually. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors for without their support, events like this would not be possible. I want to start with our presenting sponsor, brought to you by our founder, Joan Webb, and the New Home Company. Thank you for your support every single year we've done this. Our platinum sponsors include Brookfield Residential and Taylor Morrison. Our gold sponsors are First Service Association Consulting, Jackson Titus, Trammell Crow Residential, and Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. The silver sponsors are Myers Research, Outdoor Dimensions, and SoCal Gas Company. Thank you to our bronze sponsors that you can see on the screen. Now, last but not least, we are grateful Loan Depot chose to be the speaker sponsor for this event. Here's a quick video highlighting what Loan Depot can offer. Hi, I'm Tammy Richards, Chief Operating Officer for Loan Depot. We're so proud to be sponsors of this amazing Women's Builder event. Things have changed in the last six months, become a lot more virtual and a lot more digital. Loan Depot has been ready for just such a day. We have an online digital application, digital validations, and we have a very automated process with the ability to offer a virtual closing with remote notarization for customers, a full end-to-end -end paperless process, eliminating all that boring paperwork that used to go with having a mortgage completed. We love being partners with the builder community and actually did over 17,000 builder loans last year. We're the number two non-bank lender and we're here to serve the builder community. It's, there's nothing more satisfying than watching a family move into their new home. So grateful for the opportunity we have to partner with you in that exciting process. And it feels like it's a higher, it's a higher purpose right now with what's happening in America for us to be able to provide homes for families to be safe and shelter in place. I hope you have a fantastic time during your conference. We do some women's conferences at Loan Depot as well. We have a, a group called Women Empowering Women where we mentor and coach and help women to be able to reach their full potential within their careers and also to achieve their goals. And it's really women supporting each other and I believe that must be what this event is feeling like as well. I wish I could meet with all of you in person. I hope you stay safe and have a really fun time at this event. Thank you again for allowing us to sponsor and for allowing us to be your business partner. Hope you have a fantastic day. Again, thank you to our sponsors for your ongoing support and enabling this event to continue year after year. Finally, I wanna shout out to our wonderful committee that met every month from mid 2019 to early 2020 in planning our in-person event. While we had to pivot away from our original plans, the passion and commitment from the group is undeniable. Thank you to the committee for everything. Now, some 
of you may be wondering how we were able to secure St. Marshall for this event today. And there are two people who made this happen. Besides Sint's team and Sint herself, Robin Robinson with Fusco Engineering and her daughter, Kelly Robinson, the youth basketball coordinator with the Dallas Mavericks. Without their help, we wouldn't have such an inspirational woman with us here today. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Robin. Before we pass the mic to Sint, I want to address some current landscape for the home building industry and for women in particular. Today's economy is writing the future textbooks and housing will be one of the clear winners of 2020. Through restraint, our learnings from last cycle and a shift to home as our focal point in the pandemic, we have been one of the bright spots in an otherwise rocky recovery. It didn't start that way though. I know you all can vividly remember mid-March through the end of April. Friends in the industry were losing their jobs. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you didn't lose your job, but you had your hours, your salary, or your bonus cut. Home sales plummeted for six weeks, and all of us had flashbacks to the great financial crisis. Business leaders and employees were determined to not live through another 2008 and scrambled and hustled to adapt to our new reality. And then something surprising happened. People got bored. People realized they didn't like their existing space. Mortgage rates dropped to 3% while resale inventory fell off a cliff. And because of our industry's tenacity and innovation, we were ready to help the buyers. Our virtual tours and safety first model visits did not act as a deterrent. If anything, people were pleased to be offer a COVID free option. Furloughed workers all of a sudden started to get called back. Incentives, they almost disappeared. Online traffic went through the roof. Home sales in July posted a nearly 35% year over year increase marking the best sales pace since 2007. And strong sales have carried into August. Construction has already regained 60% of the jobs lost in March and April, making us the best sector in the economy right now. We are lucky to be in the home building industry, but women, and especially women of color did not fare well in this recession. That's why you may have heard the phrase she session, highlighting that women were disproportionately hit hard over the past five months. Let's put some numbers behind it. The unemployment rate for white men is 8.3% compared to 9.6% for white women and 13.5% for black women. Normally, the pay gap between men and women closes in a downturn, but today it's the complete opposite. Once a woman lost her job this year, she struggled to regain employment because of increased childcare and home duties. Census data shows one in three women are not working due to childcare issues directly linked to COVID-19. Not only that, but women account for 77% of occupations that require close personal contact. In fact, small businesses owned by women are often in retail and leisure and hospitality, sectors not suited to a pandemic. Women have been forced to choose between what's best for them financially and what's best for their health and family. But the hope is, once a vaccine or a strong antiviral is approved and our life starts to resemble what it once was, the progress we made for equality, both as an industry and as a country returns. And maybe we don't even need to wait that long. We made history this week 
with the first black woman and the first Asian American woman to accept the nomination on a major party's presidential ticket. This is something we all should be proud of, regardless of political party. We have another history maker with us here today, and I am very honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Sint Marshall. Sint is the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks and was the first black woman CEO in the National Basketball Association. Sint is gonna provide her story, but as a primer, she was a top executive at AT&T for 36 years until she retired. And then she got a call from Mark Cuban and the rest is history. Please submit your questions during the presentation as we will have time for Q&A at the end. Sint, we are so excited to have you here with us today. So please take it away. All right, yes. I am here for the sisterhood today and I'm so happy to be here. Robin Robinson, I love you. I love your daughter, Kelly. She is a rock star. Uh, so congratulations, mom, you have done your job. I am happy to be here. I bring you greetings from Orlando, Florida. Yes, I got here last night. I am in the bubble. Uh, so I will be here for games three and four. Uh, we are in the playoffs. Yes, the Mavs are in the playoffs uh, for the first time since 2016. And I am so excited. So I am here. I got uh, on a plane last night. I look like an astronaut. I had so much stuff on, all my gear. I am safe. This bubble is safe. I've had two COVID tests already uh, this morning. Uh, so the NBA has done an amazing job uh, providing a very safe uh, environment. But I want to come in last night because I wanted to make sure I was set up uh, to hang out with all my new friends uh, today. So I am, I am sitting here on the couch. I know we're going to have a couch conversation later uh, with Joan and Allie. Uh, so I'm all on the couch. I have my computer set up on a uh, room service tray. So I am not playing around here. I am ready to hang out with you. I have on my Dallas Mav sweats. That's right, but you can't see them. Okay, let me tell you, we've got a, I have a few ground rules uh, when I speak, and I think I've got about uh, 45 minutes or so, and then we're going to have some Q&A, which I'm looking forward to. Okay, so let me just give you the ground rules. Uh, the first one is that you have to actually talk back to your screen, or you have to put something in chat. Usually, of course, we're together when we do all this, and so we have a lot of interaction. We hug, we talk back. I'm a church girl. I grew up in church. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. Don't worry about it. We're not going to be here three or four hours, uh, but I like to have interactions. So you just have to just pretend like you are talking to me, yell into that scream, say, get it sent, amen, sister, something, okay? I want some noise out there wherever you are. And then I want you to get your phone. So if you are watching on the phone, that's great. If you're not watching on your phone, if you're on your computer or some other device, then you need to get your phone because there's going to come a time when I'm, I'm going to ask you to text to a sister, I'm going to ask you to, normally we would do it live, what have you, go talk to somebody, uh, but I still want uh, the interaction because just because we are physically distant does not mean we have to be socially distant. So I want you to have your phone out so you can make um, a little bit of noise, okay? And then you'll have some time where I'm just going to pretend like you're right in front of me and we're going to talk. Okay, so today's topic is building resilience. I love this. So that's what I want to talk about. My life in terms of resilience, and I'm gonna give you my two cents about life, if that's okay, my two cents, because of course I'm sent. Now, since y'all are a building association and you build for a living, uh, I thought I'd tell you about uh, my story uh, using my foundation, talk to you about my ground floor, some lessons I've learned as I've been climbing the staircase. I wanna talk about the walls that surround me and then I'll take you on top of the roof. Is that okay? That's when you yell into the mic and you yell into your screen and you say, yes, sent. go sister, tell it like it is. Tell your story, sister. All right, I heard you, I'm gonna tell it. So let me give you my story. And this is the foundation. And the reason I like to tell at least the beginning of my story is because it truly is my foundation. It informs who I am, my values, what I believe, and it gives people a sense uh, for who I am. Now, if you know anything about your civil rights history, uh, you know that there was a church bombed in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. 
the 16th Street Baptist Church. That church was my mother's church. She left that church three years prior to that bombing. She grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, as did my dad. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. We left Birmingham when I was three months old uh, because my parents didn't want their kids growing up in the Jim Crow South and experiencing all the things that they had experienced growing up. So we left when I was a baby, moved to California, to the San Francisco Bay Area. So I am a California girl. Uh, so we moved to the Easter Hill Public Housing Projects in Richmond. And so many of the things you can think about that happen in a public housing project, those things happen to me. I've experienced it. I've seen a lot. But fortunately, my mother taught us it's not where you live, it's how you live. And so when I was 11 years old, I saw my father actually shoot a man in the head in self-defense. And actually, it was more in defense of me because my mother had called us all to the back room, all five, uh, six of us. And so I was in the back room with my five brothers and sisters. Um, and believe it or not, I know, it's, I know it's hard to believe right now, but I was actually a quiet kid. I would just sit in the corner with my books. I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. I sit in the corner with my books, but I always wanted to know what was going on. Very observant. So when all this commotion broke out at our front door, I decided I'd sneak around the side and join my father at the front door. Well, that's when my dad knew that I was no longer in the back room with my five brothers and sisters, but actually in the potential pathway of a bullet. And the young man who was having an altercation with my dad at the front door ended up pointing a silver pistol, and I can still see it, down to my father's right side at me. Uh, my father shot back in self-defense. Fortunately, it wasn't fatal but you can imagine the chaos that broke out uh, in our neighborhood. And because of that, we were sequestered, we meaning me and my five brothers and sisters, we were sequestered in the house for safety purposes with my mom. We couldn't go to school, but my mother figured out a way for me to get to school because I cried, cried, cried when I couldn't go to school because up until that point, I'm in the seventh grade, I was always taught that education was a big deal that education was my ticket out. Now at the time, I didn't know what out meant. I didn't know it meant my ticket out of poverty and my ticket to opportunity, but education was always stressed to me. And so I ended up uh, going to school because my mom got a uniform police officer, Officer Daryl Prater in the Richmond Police Department. She got him to take me to school every day after that incident in the seventh grade. He would either, he'd show up in his police uniform, he'd either throw me in his car, he'd put me right in the front seat and take me to school, or he would walk to the, he'd leave his car in the neighborhood and walk to the bus stop and get on the bus and take me to school. He did exactly what it said on his car. He said he was there to protect and to serve. And he spent almost a year of his life protecting and serving me so that I could get to school. Fast forward uh, four years, my father uh, and mom divorced. It was an ugly divorce. It was a violent uh, divorce. We were the victims of uh, domestic violence. It was a bloody summer. Uh, we left our house uh, for almost three months, so the entire summer uh, after my brother graduated from high school, and the police escorted us out uh, for safety. Stay with my sister all summer in her one-bedroom apartment. My mother's prayer was that we would make it back. She still had three kids at home. I was the oldest. And her prayer was that we would make it back home before school started because of course, education was a big deal. I was going to be a junior in high school, head cheerleader in all these clubs. She wanted us to get back to school. So five days before school started, all the dust had settled. We made it back home. When we got back home, we walked into a four bedroom unit in the uh, housing projects because of course, six kids, two parents, we had the big unit and it was empty. There was one mattress for me and my younger sister to sleep on. And I remember us being all upset. I'm 15, she's 13, my brother's 12. And we're like, where's all our stuff? School is getting ready to start. We're our trophies because we were uh, big track stars and everything was gone except this mattress. And I remember my mother telling everybody to be quiet. And it was quiet, just like it is right now. And she told us, she said, all I want is peace of mind. God will provide. You all get ready to go to school. Five days later, 
I went to school and the rest is history. I had three teachers and a principal wonder why I was out there cheering with a big brace on my nose from when my father had broken my nose that summer, but it didn't matter. The only thing mattered to them was me. They wanted to know what was going on. Those educators embraced me. They embraced my mom and truly the rest is history. They didn't care that my zip code was 94804. It didn't matter to them. My education is all that mattered. And so they embraced me. They got me involved in all kinds of clubs, activities, you name it. I ended up graduating the top of my school district and got five full scholarships to the college of my choice. And I chose the University of California at Berkeley. Not because it is the number one public institution in the world. Yes, it is. But I chose it because it was only 10 or 15 minutes away from home. I could get on the Bay Area Rapper Transit and get to school in just a few minutes. And so I got my scholarship. I had a car that came with my scholarship, left it for my mom, and started my life on Berkeley's campus. And my first week in college, I mean, my first day in college, I stepped on campus. Obviously, this is all new to me. Big dream. And I was just told to dream big and to focus. That's what these educators told me, to focus. If there are any former educators out there, any current educators, anybody who's married to educators, your kids, anything, please take the time right now and clap for for all of our educators, our teachers, our principals, all the administrators, literally these educators save my life. And that's what they do every day. So in addition to those educators, literally I'm standing on the foundation of my mother who put two books in my hand at an early age. She put a math book in one hand and a Bible in the other and told me it's not where you live, it's how you live. And with God, all things are possible. So I start college. My boyfriend, who lived three hours away from me in Fresno, California, was a year ahead of me, and he called me my first week in college to tell me that he had changed schools and he was at San Francisco State University now so that he could be close to me. He told me he had a big surprise. He was right across the bridge. So I told him, I have a surprise for you, boyfriend. I will call you the day I graduate. And this is my first week in college. But I was told to dream and to focus, in fact, the four words that I live by to this day are dream, focus, pray, and act. So I told him I would call him the day I graduated. I didn't have time for some smooth talking cutie who wanted to play when I needed to study, and I'd call him when I graduated. So I had a great time at Berkeley. I was the first African-American cheerleader, uh, the first African-American in my sorority. I am a DG, so any DGs out there anchors away. And so I had a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience uh, in college. And the day I graduated from college, I called that guy. And I said, hey, Kenny, this is Sin. He said, Sin who? And he said, I haven't talked to you in almost four years. I mean, what is going on? I told him I'm graduating. I'm getting ready to start working for it. It was the phone company back then. My mom's having me this big party at six o'clock. I was so excited because obviously this was a big deal in our family. I was the first one to graduate uh, from college. And so he said he couldn't come to the party. I said, no, my mom's having me a party at six o'clock. I told you I was gonna call you the day I graduated. I just graduated at two o'clock. It's three o'clock, you gotta come to the party. He said he couldn't come to the party because he was engaged. Well, guess what? I don't know if you can see that ring. I think Beyonce has a song, so if you like it, then you gotta put a ring on it. I've been married to that boy for 37 years, yes. He showed up to the party. And I tease him all the time and tell him he was that close to missing his blessing. So we were supposed to be together. So I started my career at AT&T. And so Erin, you can go to uh, the next slide. Uh, I started my career and I actually started it based on a set of values. And so I want to tell you about my set of values. And so you know the foundation that I stand on. Here is my ground floor. And actually, you see nine, and later you will see a tenth one. This is the round floor. This is where I start. Roy Disney, who is Walt Disney, it's funny because I'm at Disney right now. Uh, Roy Disney, Walt Disney's older brother, said it's easy to make decisions if you know what your values are. And so, ladies, if you haven't done this, stop and do it. Lay out your ground floor, what are your values? And so I just wanna hit uh, a few of them right now, the ones in blue. 
uh, integrity, speak the truth. Character matters. Uh, integrity is kind of like the biggest uh, thing for me right now. Uh, there are times in your career where you will be asked, and not just in your career, but in life, uh, to not tell the truth. You have to stand on your integrity. My son, uh, who is 28 years old now, Kenneth Anthony, taught me a very valuable lesson years ago about character and integrity, and I want to share it with you. Uh, my son is adopted, and we adopted him at two and a half years old. And at about three and a half years old, uh, there was a baby picture contest at his uh, daycare. Went to La Petite Academy. So La Petite was having uh, a baby picture contest. We don't have any baby pictures of Anthony. We adopted him at two years old, two and a half, and we only have, we had at that time, one little sad picture that they gave us uh, of him. So we didn't have any baby pictures, but we just said, okay, you're, I said, you're just gonna have to take that one picture and just tell your story starting from now. So I'm walking through the kitchen and I see my husband at the kitchen table with the boy and there's a picture of a baby and they are making up this story. It was actually a picture of my nephew, Jalen, my husband's nephew. And so, you know, you don't want to argue in front of the kids, but I'm looking at my husband. I'm giving him kind of, you know, all that head action. Like, you can't do that. That is a lie. You can't do that. My husband responded right there in front of the boy and said, my job as his dad is to give him self-esteem. I'm not going to have him be the only kid there without a baby picture. I'm getting, giving him this whole story. I said, but that's not his baby picture. He goes, it doesn't matter. Nobody will know, which I don't know how my husband thought he was going to pull this off because my son is very dark skinned and my nephew, his nephew is very light complexion. So I don't even know how he thought he was going to pull this off. But he said, no, his job was to give that boy self-esteem, confidence, that he was not going to have him there, the only one without the baby picture, because back then at the time, unfortunately, uh, there was a, and a stigma to being adopted. So we kind of went back and forth. I finally let it go. I go off to work the next morning to San Francisco, and I just, I come home from work that evening, and guess what I walk into? The trophy from the baby picture contest is on my kitchen table. It is as big as the kid. And I look over and my husband is cheesing. He is loving this. He goes, see, look at the boy, look at him. See, I know what I'm doing, self-esteem. And my son is just smiling and I am sick at this point. And so I look at him, he goes, mom, mommy, mommy, you wanna know what happened? I wanna tell you the story about what happened today. And at this point, I'm just sick. I said, yes, baby, tell me this story. He said, I got up in front of everybody and I said, hi, everybody. And I held up the picture and I said, hi, this is my cousin Jalen. He said, it's my cousin Jalen. I don't have any baby pictures because I'm adopted because I was born in a bathtub. And when I was nine months old, my mother left me because she was on drugs and the police took her away. And my nine year old brother was taking care of me in a shopping cart for months. And he's telling his whole story. He said, but then I got adopted and I got a thousand hundred cousins and Jalen is one of them. He said, mommy, everybody just started crying and they just gave me the trophy. Okay. Here is the moral to that story. Even with his parents permission to lie, and I will say his parents, because I didn't completely shut it down when I left the house the next morning. With his parents' permission to lie, he told the truth. Why did he do that? Because it was in him to do that. It's in all of us. At three and a half years old, it was in him, it's in us. This is something that is a non-starter. Don't let anybody ever take it away from you. So that's one of my values. Fun is another one of my values. I like to teach a lot of lessons. I like to teach a lot of lessons at work. I do a lot of training around diversity and inclusion. I like to take time to celebrate, so I like to have a good time. So if we were all together, I would teach you a lesson right now and we would dance. And I would teach you a lesson about the difference between diversity and inclusion, because a lot of times we focus on diversity. That is the mix. That's, uh, you can almost see, you can see most of the diversity, not all. But we don't often focus on what do we do with that mix? How do we make people feel? That's what inclusion is about. Diversity is a fact. Inclusion is a choice. Diversity is what we have. Inclusion is what we do. Diversity is about the mix. Inclusion is about what do you do with that mix? It's not enough to just have me as a woman, as the only woman at the table. I need to feel included. I need to feel welcome. I need to know what the rules are. And so the way I describe it is diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion, is being asked to dance. So I want everybody to, to just get up from where you are. I can't get up because then you can't see me. You would just see my um, Dallas Mavericks uh, sweatpants. 
but just get up and exercise for a few minutes because what I would teach you right now is the Cupid Shuffle. How many of you actually know how to do the Cupid Shuffle? Okay, raise your hands wherever you are. How many of you don't know how to do it? Okay, so if we were all together, Aaron would start playing this song. So just give me a little bit of it, Aaron, but not all of it because we can't get up and dance right now. Aaron would start to play that. And then we, those of us who know how to do it, we would teach it to everybody else because there is nothing like being invited to the party until you are actually asked to dance. And that's what d diversity is. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Ladies, when we are invited to the tables and to tables that we are normally not at, we have to de demand inclusion. We have to de demand a request to dance, a request to know what the rules are. We have to be made to feel included. And I like, like to just describe that as shall we dance. Don't just show up to the table, make sure you know all the rules and you are included and welcomed at the table. Next slide, next slide. Okay, teamwork, that's one of my values. Now that's a picture of me in college uh, with uh, 120 or so of my white sorority sisters. Uh, it was a fabulous experience uh, living in the house with my DGs. This is where I learned teamwork. We used to sing a song every Monday night when we had Vespers. I was 19 years old. I thought it was so corny that we would sing this song, No Man is an Island. And later in life, I learned truly what that song meant. And it, of course, No Man is an Island, No Woman Either. It says, No Man is an Island, No Man Stands Alone. Each man's joy is joy to me. Each man's grief is my own. We need one another, so I will defend each man or woman as my brother, each man as my friend. I learned the value of teamwork, and I still practice it. And I practice it now in something that I call hasu. So I need everybody to just yell at the screen, screen and say hasu, H-A-S-U. Sometimes you are in those moments, we actually had one this morning, where you just need a sister to help you out. All Hasu is, is hook a sister up. You have those times where it, it, you are struggling and when somebody says it's a Hasu moment, they need you. And our response as women, as the sisterhood, just has to be, yes, it's a Hasu moment. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to pull your phones out right now. Aaron's gonna play. Uh, my favorite song, and I want you to text three women. Pull your phones out right now. Pull them out. I want you to text three women, three sisters, and tell them you can count on me. I'll explain later. This is all about teamwork, and ain't no mountain high enough to keep us from being there for each other. Give the house moment right now. Aaron, give me a song. Text three women and tell them you can count on me. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. Remember that hashtag. You make it real easy just to be there for each other. And I practice that a lot. There's nothing like the sisterhood. That's why these leadership, these women's leadership conferences are so important. Next one, authenticity is very important to me. It took me 25 years of my professional career before I finally decided it was okay to be me. And that's why the hashtag is do you. 25 years. In fact, Aaron, go to the next slide. Let me just show you uh, my AT&T career. Those are, the fifth, those are the things I learned from my 15 jobs at AT&T. It was a wonderful, wonderful 36 year career. Technical jobs, non-technical, lines, staff, public policy, you name it. I learned something from every single job, but it wasn't until I got that job as the president of AT&T North Carolina, that be grateful job, when the company moved us there, where I had to tell my story to some young people one night, and I told my entire story. The domestic violence, the abuse, the miscarriages, the you name it. I went from one thing to another and finally got in touch with who I was. Even though I had a job where I turned down a promotion and I turned down an officer position because my boss 
told me all the stuff she wanted me to change, things about fundamentally who I am. Even though I had turned that job down, I sort of knew who I was, but it wasn't until I got to AT&T North Carolina where I finally got in touch with who I am. Don't wait 25 years in your professional career to get in touch with who you are and you can do you. That's so important to us at the Dallas Mavs, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So that's my career. In a nutshell, I have learned three L's. As a leader, my job is to listen to the people, love the people, listen to the people, learn from the people, and then love the people. If I do those three, then I can lead people. And so that's what I have learned. My skills are transferable. I have learned to show up. Sometimes you don't want to show up in places, but you do have to show up and you have to show up as you because you must be present to win. Okay, move on. So then that's career one. Then I get into career two. Of course, because once I retired, I said I was gonna take a year off. My, my daughters were graduating from high school and college. The boys were already out. So I was gonna take a year off for me. Well, then I didn't get my year off because the chairman of Dow Chemical Company wanted me to start uh, a consulting company to help him transform his culture. So I did that. 10 months into starting my own leadership consulting company, I got a call from Mark Cuban. Now I will confess, and I know it is embarrassing, but I'm going to confess, I didn't know Mark Cuban when he called me. I just didn't. In fact, it was February 21st, 2018. I had gotten up that, I woke up that morning and I wrote a blog called Impact. And it was the day that these teenagers, they were protesting in Parkland, Florida, because what had happened at their school. And I was so touched by the impact they were having on all of us, but I was personally touched by watching these teenagers, these young people stand up for their rights and their response to what had happened. And it was also the same day the Reverend Dr. Billy Graham passed away, who also I watched growing up. That was impactful for, to me. So here I am with these teenagers on the one end and 99 year old Billy Graham on the other end, and I am literally age-wise smack dab in the middle. And I thought, what impact am I going to have in this world? And so I wrote a blog, I wrote a blog post about it. I finished that up and got on a call with my client. And all of a sudden my text messages started coming in. I actually thought it was one of, I have four kids. I thought it was one of my kids asking for money. I mean, I guess just what I thought. I gave my husband the phone and I said, one of the kids need money, handle it. And he was gone for a minute or two. He came back. He said, um, you need to hang up that call. It's not one of the kids. Mark Cuban is trying to reach you. And I said, who is that? He said, Mark Cuban. And so he's telling me who he is and all that. And I still don't know who he is. Uh, you know, I'm from San Francisco Bay Area. So I had another team and all that, but I don't anymore. I'm diehard Mavs now. And so I ended up calling Mark. He wanted to see me right then. He told me he had a crisis. A Sports Illustrated article came out. He told me kind of what was going on. Ladies, I told him I couldn't see him because I had a mammogram scheduled at two o'clock because I have learned the hard way what happens when you don't keep your doctor's appointments. So he wasn't exactly ready to hear that. He paused and said, okay, I'll come to you or you can come to me anytime after that is fine. So I come back home, my husband is dressed in Mavs colors, head to toe. And he's even, he's even telling me what colors to wear. He goes, don't go in there with that blue and gold, no Golden State Warrior stuff, no Cal Berkeley stuff. These are the colors of the Dallas Mavericks. I guess the boy meant for me to go, and I guess he was going with me, but I didn't know. So we end up going to see Mark uh, Cuban. I actually read about the whole story on my way there because I wanted to know what I was getting into. I spent about 55 minutes with Mark. It was a very genuine uh, conversation where he asked me if I would be the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks. He told me uh, that some folks had given me, uh, given him my name, and I told him I had to pray about it. I had to go home and think about it. I actually, ladies, I, wa I wasn't going to take the job because I just didn't know if I just didn't know what was going on and didn't know if I wanted to get involved in it. As I was leaving his office, two women stopped me. Two women. You know how we do. They pulled me to the side and they said, we need you. And they started telling me some things and they actually grabbed my heart 
I went home, I prayed about it. I came back the next day. I was in a conference room for three hours before Mark even knew that I had come back. I knew I had to do it for the sisterhood. Now the brotherhood has benefited from it, but I benefited from it, but I knew I had to do it for the sisterhood. And here's what I laid out for us. I said, by 2019, the Dallas Mavericks organization is setting the NBA standard for inclusion and diversity. We didn't have any women in permanent leadership positions uh, when I got there. Uh, basically, all white men ran the Dallas Mavericks. Right now, my, my leadership team is 50% women. Yell at the screen, 50%. Yes. My leadership team is 50% women and 47% people of color. We, set, we, um, we stand on a set of values and you see what they are. They spell crafts. We perfect our crafts every day. Character, respect, authenticity, fairness, teamwork, and safety. I focused on fairness a lot and I wanna share a video with you so you can see the first, the very first issue that I focused on at the Dallas Mavericks, gender pay equity. If I was prime minister, I'd make it illegal. Ladies. $7. It should be flat out illegal. Like, I'm not joking. I'm not being unreasonable. Women and men should have the same money. They should have 50 50. 60 60 if you want to do 120. It should just be how hard you work. If you do the same work, you should get paid the same money. What we're trying to tell you is that it's not fair that boys get paid more than girls. Maybe if the men notice they were being paid more than the women, they should speak up about it. When I am older, I'm going to make a change. If I don't forget. Ugh. Ugh, I have no words, it's so wrong. Okay, so that was the first issue uh, that we focused on. We do not have a gender pay equity issue at the Dallas Mavericks. In fact, I would just let you know, the sisterhood is running the place, okay? And we are doing quite well with these 50% women in leadership at the Dallas Mavericks. So back to my values, family. Uh, fam family is big for me. I have a hashtag, know your crystal balls from your rubber balls. Crystal balls are things that if you drop them, and I actually have one here. I have a crystal ball right here. If you drop them, they shatter. They never come back. Rubber balls have one right here. And if you work for me, I, people will tell you, I will throw them at you and just say, it, it'll come back later. Women, there's some things that you cannot drop. And I'll give you an example. Uh, when I worked for AT&T in North Carolina, uh, they asked me if I could go to Washington DC a full week to help lobby on some issues. It wasn't my job, but they wanted me to help them. And I said, absolutely. I just can't go on Wednesday afternoon, afternoon because it's my son's first high school swim meet. They're like, yeah, okay. So I get to Washington DC, I get my schedule that Monday morning and I'm in the team meeting and the most important policymakers, the most important congressmen and senators who they wanted me to meet with were scheduled for Wednesday afternoon. I told them, I told you I can't do this. So when my son was starting his first race in his first high school swim meet, the individual met Lee and he looked up for his dad because of course at home too, they told me not to come back. He looked up for his dad and guess what? He saw his dad, his sister, and he also saw his mama. He won that race. I can, I'm convinced he won it because his mama was in the stands. We had dinner that night, Thursday morning, six o'clock. I was on a plane and guess who I just so happened to meet with? Those same policymakers who were scheduled for Wednesday afternoon. Yes, some people would say it was only a swim meet, but you know what? It was his first high school swim meet in a brand new state in a brand new school. That was crystal for me. I wasn't going to drop it because it wasn't coming back. 
second swim meet, something else, yes, maybe it'll bounce back. Know your crystal balls from your rubber balls. That's how I set my priorities. Know what is going to drop and shatter and you'll never see it again. And then know what will come back. These honeys are crystal to me. These are three of my four kids. All of my children are adopted. They all have sad, pitiful, abuse, abandoned, neglect stories. In fact, my son in the middle there picked both of his sisters off television. One is a San Francisco uh, Wednesday's child and one is a North Carolina Friday's child. In fact, when we moved him off to college, I told him, give, <laughs> give me the remote control because I mean, I'll, two days of the week, I don't need five more. So fast forward, um, my son who, uh, and this is the one I tell you the story about, um, the uh, baby picture contest story about his brother who was nine years old when he was nine months old when they were abandoned is in that picture now. We were able to find Ricky at 14. And so now he is my uh, 38 years old, 38 year old. So I have 22, 25, 28 and 37. They call me the queen of the castle. And I am, I literally have a bell that I ring on Mother's Day. This is my bell. I start ringing it at midnight and I ring it until 1159 on Mother's Day. I ring it all day, even with them growing up now, I call them because I am the queen of the castle. My work team had the nerve one time to give me a tiara. So I wear that too all day on Mother's Day and I keep a tiara in my office and I'm gonna send one of these to Joan, to Allie, uh, to all those who put this together. I wear this in the office too, because I am the queen of the castle at work and at home and I need the fellas and everybody else to remember that. So everybody, if we were together, all of you would have gotten a tiara. So we'll figure that out. I have passed out thousands. It's just my little sisterhood toolkit. So we can always remember who we are. Okay, let me get to my, usually I just, in fact, let me just keep it on. Okay, because I'm feeling pretty uh, royal right now because I'm loving this. Okay, my last one is health. Health matters. It didn't matter to me, honestly. I was always in good shape. I always felt good about being an athlete, all of that, until December 2010 when I was diagnosed the day before New Year's Eve with stage three colon cancer, one lymph node before stage four. It was brutal. It was devastating. It was the first time in my life that I had to focus on my physical, mental, and spiritual health all at once. Embrace your PMS. Yell into, in fact, let me just ask you a question right now. Do you have PMS? And I'm talking to the man too. Do you have PMS? Physical, mental, and spiritual health. It is so important for us to hold each other accountable. I ended up in a corporate athlete session at work that made us take a survey that finally led me to respond to something that had been sitting on my nice stand for six months, a referral for a colonoscopy. And so I didn't get it. I didn't do it when they told me to do it. My last day of being 50 is when I had the colonoscopy and on my 51st birthday is when I got a call from my doctor telling me that he was going to have a surgeon call me. I learned the hard way. I learned the hard way. Stop and take care of your medical business. Take care of your health. Yes, they told me I had six months to live. That was almost 10 years ago. So by the grace of God and some, yes, some fabulous medical professionals, I am cancer-free and I'm here to tell you to embrace your PMS. Okay, my next slide, let me wrap it up with the lessons that I have learned in my life. I have learned Always remember where you came from or you might forget where you're going. This is the roof. This is what's, what covers me. This is the top of my house. Do the right thing. There's a difference between doing things right and doing the right thing. Show up. You must be present to win, especially sometimes as women. There are some places we don't want to show up to. We have to show up to them. I have also learned that sometimes the light at the end of the tunnel is a train. Bad things do happen to good people. Accept adversity and never get, give up. And when, when bad things happen, sometimes it's not what happens, it's how we respond to what happens. Respond gracefully because bad things do happen. I have learned that people matter 
And that's all that matters. And that's why I wanted you to text three sisters or brothers and tell them you can count on me. We have to be here for each other. Embrace your sisters and brothers. Obviously, we can't do a lot of that right now during COVID. We can't physically embrace them, but send text messages, call. We truly do need each other. I have learned to protect what's important to me. What's important to me is probably, it could be different than what's important to you. Identify at least three things that are just non-starters. They are so important to you and focus on those. I've learned the value of getting mad, M-A-D, making a difference. And I've also learned how to find my passion and my purpose and cry and get busy. There's a lot to cry about right now. We have a double pandemic going on. COVID-19, and you can see how we responded to it and our social justice issues. Yes, many of us have been mourning with a grieving nation, but I am convinced, especially as women, as women, yes, we build resilience while restoring a nation, but I'm convinced as women, we can help to restore all of this. And so here's what I think we need to do as women. And this is my last slide and I am right on time. As women, it's okay to cry. We cry like a baby, we fight like a girl, and then change the world like a woman. Erin, give me my last song and I'm turning it back over to Allie because at the end of the day, what I want you to know and what we need to let the world know is just, yes, we are signed up as women. We are sealed by the sisterhood and we will deliver what needs to be delivered. Wrap it on up, Erin. Thank you, God bless you. All right, I'm done. I'm turning it over to you. Who? Allie, Joan, somebody, take over. Okay, here we are. Sent. You know, we've had we've been blessed with this conference that um, I was honored to to found six years ago. We've had fighter pilots, first woman, you know, to to uh, fly a, a Navy jet. We've had Olympians. We've had Hollywood executives that have broken ground, but we have never had a woman like you that matches the time. And so what you bring to us on diversity and leadership Two qualities that, for me personally, I think are, are greatly lacking in our national dialogue right now. To have you on our stage, uh, we're just so grateful. And, you know, words, it's, it's, it's really, for me personally, I, I was really doubting whether we should go forward with the virtual conference this year uh, because we had so much vested in, in our in-person. But guess what? One, having you, which is amazing, but two, we got to reach people that would never, ever have been able to come to Orange County and attend our conference. So, you know, what, uh, just again, huge blessings and thanks. And uh, Thank you. Thank Allie, Allie and I are going to now jump onto your sofa because this was going to be our little virtual sofa <laughs> chat. Yes. And... Yes. Uh, Yes, my, my husband, Larry, who is um, an icon in our industry as well, is in the other room, and he texted me that I should stand up and dance with you, but I have shorts on, and I'm not doing that to the audience, so. That's okay. You got shorts on. I got, girl, I got sweatpants on. <laughs> it's a little hot here, but it's probably hot in Florida, too. It is. Um, it is. Larry and I are huge Mavs fans, and- I not as huge as Lakers fans, which will make sense for all of those that are watching that are NBA fans to understand that the Mavs are in the playoffs playing against the Clippers. So if you are a big Lakers fan, you really are a Mavs fan too now. So That's right. That's congratulations for being back in the playoffs. And um, before Allie and I get going, I just have to ask you, I know you didn't know Mark Cuban, but were you an NBA fan before this? Huge. Oh, yeah. Okay. Huge. Yes. Oakland? Oakland? Warriors? No, I, yes. I actually had on, and it's, I mean, it's not a secret anymore. I actually had on Golden State Warrior sweats and Steph Curry socks when Mark Cuban called me. <laughs> 
so we had to have a little ceremony and with the kids and everything and pack up all my Golden State Warriors stuff and get rid of it. And we're all Mavs fans now. But yes, I was a huge, huge NBA fan and Warriors fan and just hadn't followed the Mavs because I was just hanging on to my uh, Warriors. But they're gone now. They're not in the playoffs, and we are. So, Sid, have you met Steph Curry? Yes, I have. That must have been so fun, though, because even if they're a different he's team, amazing. it must have been a dream. He's amazing. And my daughter actually went up to him last year at a home Mavs game. And I said, where are you going? She says, I have to go and say hi to Steph Curry. <laughs> and she's got all her Mavs stuff on, and he was so wonderful. And he stopped and he hugged her and all that, even though she had all her Mavs stuff on. So. And for oh, that- for those who were watching the uh, the convention last night, uh, Steph and his wife and his two gorgeous daughters just did a great snap. I'd welcome people to go you you know watch it on YouTube because it was it was really it was awesome. I love our NBA players. Uh, when I think about all of our players, and I th- of course like you know our Mavs players as well, uh, these guys are champions on and off the court. I mean they are uh, they're just down for the cause. They're wonderful people. They use their platform. Uh, in such great ways. Our guys literally through COVID, they were out all the time doing public service announcements, reaching out to kids. Uh, They were showing up with all this virtual learning. We have something called Mavs Learning Assist. They were actually showing up on the screen in kids' living rooms, uh, helping to teach the science of basketball and different things out, you know, making sure, you know, writing checks to make sure healthcare workers can have childcare. I mean, they're, they're, they're just good guys. And so to see uh, Steph on the convention last night, I, I love these guys. I, lo- I love all of them uh, because they use their platform the right way, which is awesome. Awesome. And uh, I just have to ask, so on Mark, um, what's it like working for a uh, tech billionaire shark tank guy who like is big on social media so how often like how often do you talk do you guys meet him what's the relationship like i talked to him he called me when i was uh getting ready to board my flight last well he actually called as i was going through security and then once i got to my gate um i uh called him back uh but he's actually he's great he's great uh to work for i always you know they say some people think they're the smartest person in the room well, he actually usually is the smartest person in the room, but he doesn't act like that. Uh, he gives, he teaches, he wants to learn things. So he's learned a lot about culture transformation and a lot of things since I've been with him. And then I'm learning the business of basketball and just a lot of, lot of things uh, from him. So I think we are a, a good match and we press each other. And he's one of those bosses too, where when you're talking to him and you know how busy he is, he has so much stuff going on. He makes me feel like I'm the only person on the planet when I'm talking to him. And I know he has a lot of things going on. I've never called him where he didn't call me right back. I've never said, can I meet with you? Can you come over where he wasn't there whenever I wanted him to be there? Um, And he's just, uh, he's he's good to be with. And he's a family guy. So I like that. I love people when they understand their priorities. Uh, So it's just, it's all working. It's good. We're good. We're a good match. And he's bold and crazy and wild. And I am too. So I think probably the time in our life too at some point you just realize you know you got to do you and he's doing him and i'm doing me so it's a good match it's a good match and he's very philanthropic he's very philanthropic people have no idea the stuff he does every day so he has a huge heart so you brought up a good point about just being in a leadership role and being able to stop everything around you and be able to focus on one person or one task at hand do you find when you have people come into your office, are you half on your phone and half checking your emails and, and half doing it? Or do you shut everything off and give them the full attention that they deserve when they get your time? I shut it off. I shut it off. Now, he, here's what I do. And, I, and, and I'm doing it right now. I keep my phone. And I've done this for years. I mean, for years. I keep my phone right here in case one of my kids call. Because my kids. And so I, I called everybody this morning and say I'm out of pocket for two hours. So I, I tell them to schedule. If one of them called me right now, I would say, hold on a minute, and I would talk to them because I mean, it's Crystal. Okay, they, they, don't, they, 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 don't, you know, they don't call me all the time. They know I'm a busy woman, and they, they know they need money all the time, so let me do what I got to do, okay? <laughs> so uh, I, I, that's the only thing that can distract me. Other than that, you have my attention because that's respect. I mean, that's just truly respect. You're respecting somebody's time. If they're in your office, if they've asked to meet with you, or you know, I have one-on-ones 
uh, with my team. In fact, I had a one-on-one -on -one with literally every single employee at the Mavs when I got there. Uh, that first 100 days, uh, actually it was in 90 days. So when I'm sitting there talking to you, you got me. You got me. Maybe I you can, on following up, because uh, for those that know, when Mark Cuban called you, the articles had been about the sexual harassment um, and generally tough culture that you were walking into. So maybe you can share with us, how, how do you tackle that? How do you walk in and and tackle that kind of environment, that kind of culture? Okay, I think it, I think it was pretty much in, in just a few, a few steps. Uh, I uh, walked in with a vision that I shared with you earlier, uh, and it was a vision around inclusion and diversity on purpose uh, because of what I read, because of what I knew about the mistreatment of women. So that was the vision that I wanted to lay out. It wasn't about sales. It wasn't about sponsorships. It wasn't about anything else other than inclusion and diversity because I knew we had to do something. Uh, so laid out a vision, laid out those values, and said these values will not just be on the walls, but they will operate in the halls. Everything we do will be based on character, respect, authenticity, fairness, teamwork, and safety. And with safety, I stressed physical and emotional uh, safety. So we kind of like, you know, got that, uh, you know, just really drilled into the people. And then I put together a 100 day plan that I actually wrote on an airplane. And that 100 day plan had four parts. Uh, one was to model zero tolerance. Uh, so we had a few different investigations going on, put a hotline in place, all of that. Uh, the second was to develop a MAVS women's agenda, an agenda totally focused on educating, empowering, uh, uplifting women, uh, put a women's uh, employer resource group in place, all that. Uh, the next piece was around cultural transformation. What are the kind of things we need to do to make this a great place to work, to institutionalize an inclusive culture, uh, to make sure uh, we have employees engaged, to make sure really that the culture is right. And then the fourth one was just operational effectiveness. What are the things we need to focus on? Pay, gender pay equity, uh, performance reviews, that kind of stuff. How do you run a business? And so we put the 100 day plan in place. I met with every single employee at the Dallas Mavs. They all had a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we added to the 100 day plan and then we had that 100 day plan on the wall and big poster boards. And as an organization, we would check off the items. Everybody uh, was invested. So we totally invested in the people and uh, we got it done. We got it done. And yeah, of course, I have to change out the leadership team. And right. so you, you do what you have to do. If people can't so catch the vision, they can go. So since then, besides, you obviously came into a unique situation where there were those sexual harassment charges and you kind of came in to transform the culture, but just in a normal company that isn't facing something like that, why should they care about setting and meeting diversity and inclusion metrics? Uh, there is a business case. I mean, it's, it's not just it's the right thing to do or the moral thing to do. Uh, there's a business case that says you make decisions faster, you get a better return on your investment. The companies who have uh, women are at a minimum, at a minimum, 35% more profitable uh, than other companies. I mean, if you go to, there's an organization called Catalyst, uh, McKinsey has a study, you can go to Diversity Inc. There's so many uh, uh, metrics out there that will show you financial performance, customer service performance, employee engagement performance, what happens when you have a diverse group of people around the table? It will show you what happened when you have women in leadership. Uh, so if you want to be successful, yeah, morally is good, all that is good, but if you wanna just be successful as a business, you need to have diversity. And, and we spent a lot of time in the organization, I personally spent a lot of time with our folks, helping them understand the true business case, why this is important. And so we get it. We get it, and, and, and most of them, I think, can articulate to you the business case. You know, we, we think of that the building industry, we just don't think we, we know, that it, it's a very male-dominated industry. It started off, you know, hundreds of years ago from fathers, you know, nailing and framing and handing the tool belt to their son. And uh, and we've made we've made headway. It we're 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 doing it. We're doing the tough work. We're not we're not quite where we want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've got to ask you. So you've got double layers in the NBA family. You are in a, a male sport 
industry. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, it was a white male um, leadership when you walked in. Compared to your 30 some odd years at AT AT&T as an executive, do you find it more challenging or less challenging uh, being the only woman in the room or one of few women in the room in the MBA family? It's about the same. Uh, I grew up in technology. I mean, I grew up uh, in a male, do- a white male dominated uh, industry. And so it is, uh, it's about the same. Uh, of course, in my time with AT&T, especially my last five years there, I had a, a hand with a, a team of others uh, in really diversifying it and changing the culture from all our different mergers that we have. That's what my whole move to North Carolina, from North Carolina to Dallas was about. Uh, when our chairman at that time, Randall Stevenson, uh, really wanted us to really focus on changing our culture. And so, and I think that's why Mark ended up getting my name. Uh, because it was something that I have been a part of at AT AT&T, male-dominated, white male-dominated organization, white male-dominated leadership, and we made a lot of strides in changing that. And so when I got here to the Mavs, I honestly felt like I had walked in a room from my days when I was an engineer or in operations at AT AT&T years ago and said, oh my goodness, it's back. And I hadn't seen it in a while. Um, And so you just, you kick in and you know what you have to do. You have to do because because I knew the I know the value of it, and so it was it was about the same. It was about the same, and so you know you, you have to focus in on inclusive behaviors versus exclusive behaviors. You, start, you have to get real tuned in to watching what happens in meetings when women are cut off and or when they come up with the good idea, but then nobody pays attention to the guy who brings it up. And then so I'm back in that mode where you know I have to call that kind of stuff out and then help people understand what is going on. And so for me, it's, it's kind of a repeat. And so since to that point, when you, you said you entered and it was a very male and white dominated, and then you started to turn the culture over and you started to add in more, and now your ratios are really in line with the general population. How did you do that without one, really turning off the legacy employees, the ones that you wanted to keep, the, the solid ones, without turning off some people and, and while, creating a new culture without creating a culture of, I've been here for a while and I'm gonna get purged and now people are afraid and and they don't feel welcome in the company anymore. How do you do that? That's such a great question and it's a delicate balance and and I'll tell you a couple of things. Uh, So so number one, I brought two people, well actually three people, I brought three women in with me uh, because I knew I would need a chief human resources officer based on everything that I had read, I knew I needed that person. I also needed a chief ethics and compliance officer that the organization did not have uh, cl- and clearly needed, and we had a lot of work to do. And then of course, someone also uh, as the chief of staff. So I brought in three uh, women with me. And then as I was having my one-on-ones, I really got to see true leadership who really, really had either been bypassed. We had someone who was actually in a temporary position, clearly, should have been permanent, just a super, superstar, uh, Aaron Feingo White, who is actually on the call right now, our VP of communications and events, she's a superstar. And I'm like, okay, I'm like, she's, a, she's a superstar. Okay, so, and so you identify the superstars as, you know, I identified the superstars as I was having all these meetings. And then of course, you hire people, you see what the gaps are, because we have to do a total reorg, set up the business and all that. And so there were three ways to do it. The folks I brought in, the folks we promoted from within, and then others that um, uh, we hired in. And when people saw that we were addressing real issues, and then they saw that others like Aaron and Allison Panasic and Gail O'Bannon, who runs our VP of Diversity and Inclusion, when they saw that these women were getting the opportunities they deserved, people started to buy in. You'd be surprised how many people are sitting back waiting for you to actually deal uh, with some issues. And so then, They just started to buy in. We had people do individual development plans uh, because what I wanted folks to know is I recognize, and I recognize this from my my one-on-ones. I remember crying one night when I called some folks in my office and said, here's what I've learned in some of these one-on-ones. Just like I went to AT&T to have a career in telecommunications, these people signed up to have a career in sports, not just a job. And we're going to give them the careers that they had. So they knew I was all in with them. Now, if you didn't step up to the values or if you had, you know, you had some misconduct or some other reasons you had to go, if it wasn't a good match, then we dealt with that. And if it was, then I can guarantee you 
that you would excel here. And our workplace promise at the Dallas Mavericks, and you know, every day I pray that we live up to it, is that every voice matters and everybody belongs. That's the workplace promise. That's the promise that I made to the employees there. And so they bought in. And some didn't. I mean, I had one guy tell his team, don't pay attention to anything that I was saying because I wouldn't last 90 days. It's been, two and a half years. it's been two and a half years and he's gone. <laughs> so um, being the flexible um, gals that we are with the new world of Zoom, we lost Allie, um, but she'll be back. She'll be back. Her computer turned off, I hope not permanently. So it's kind of funny because as she told you on our pre-call, she's got the, like the serious questions and I'm like all about basketball, right? Well, I want to really know about what the heck life is in, what life is like in the bubble for these guys. I mean, now it's been several weeks. What do you yes. hear? What, 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 how are they dealing with being away from their family? And what, what the heck, how's it going? You know what we're trying to do? Well, first of all, they, they're totally focused. I mean, they came here to win, and, you know, we're the seventh seed. Not a lot of people uh, – well, some people aren't expecting us uh, to advance to, you know, the, the next round. Uh, we know that we're good. And these guys are focused, and they've bonded. You know, they've been here for a few months together. And what we're trying to do, you know, we have the virtual fan set up. Uh, so we have some of their family members as virtual fans. In fact, I remember one of them said he looked up and uh, this was uh, Coach Doc Rivers, who I mean, we're playing the Clippers now, said he looked up and saw his granddaughter uh, and his daughter uh, up, on the, up in the stands because, of course, uh, uh, Seth Curry is his son-in-law. So we're trying to bring the family uh, in on it virtually as much as we can. And they have some activities to do, of course, on their days off and all that. Uh, but they're totally focused. I mean, they are focused and it's such a safe environment. And they're glad, they're happy to be able to play, and we're happy uh, that they're able to play and happy that we can bring sports back. And so fortunately, thank goodness for the NBA, Adam Silver and his team, they figured out how to do it. So the guys are having a good time, and they, they, they are competing. I mean, they are serious in this bubble. I know you've been watching the games. Uh, the games are really, really good. We've had several overtime games. Uh, so they're, just, they're here to compete. Yes, they miss their families, but we're trying to, we're trying to figure out a way to at least have that contact. And have anybody shared with you, is it weird playing, yeah, the virtual the virtual fans, is it weird playing in a pretty quiet environment? I mean, they've got some music out. and You know, one of our guys, uh, Dwight Powell, we were talking earlier this summer before they actually came to the bubble, and we were, and we were, somebody asked them a question. They said, isn't it going to be weird playing without fans? And he's actually not playing right now. But he said, you'd be surprised. He said, once we hit that court, you kind of, I mean, he says, yes, we like people. Uh, we like to hear all the noise because truly the fans, I mean, that's the six man. You love it. But even when they're not there, you focus when you get on that court. And so I've been watching these guys and, you know, there's some noise in there, but not nearly like having 19, 20,000 people in the arena, but they're focused on what they got to do on that court with those other four guys with them against the five guys across them. So there you go. Yeah. they're doing it. And we've got, so we've I'm on on audio. Okay, audio. Sorry, I am back. Okay, so question, and I warned you guys ahead of time that I was going to be the Debbie Downer of the conversation. Uh, but as we talk about the bubble and we talk about how there's this change in what the fact that no one's attending NBA games right now. How do you look at the loss of revenue, not only for the Mavs but also from your suppliers? The, the companies that need the games to be able to be successful? Yes, we have. I mean, that's a great question. And, and that's not a downer. I think um, we're trying to create opportunities. Here, here, here's what, here, here's the upside. There's a lot of downside, obviously. Okay, and fortunately for us, fortunately for us, over the past couple of years, we've been profitable. We focused on a lot of good things. We have good sponsors. We have a lot of season ticket holders. Uh, so we have not laid off any of our employees yet at the Dallas Mavericks. So we are blessed wow. uh, that we have been able to continue to pay our people. Uh, so that's such a blessing. We have been able to continue to uh, work with our suppliers and our sponsors. So our financial position was good, uh, but we're not crazy. Uh, we know if we go into next season, so, so and, and trust me, it has been hard work 
hanging on to what we have and trying to figure out, in fact, for our sponsors, trying to figure out since they're no longer in the arena, how do we provide digital signage? What can we do? Uh, so we're relying a lot on technology. I mean, a lot. I mean, so you'll see kind of like the Chime logo. Chime is our Jersey Patch sponsor. You'll see their logo on the court. I mean, that's all digital because obviously it's not painted on there. The only thing that's painted on there is Black Lives Matter. Uh, but so we're trying to use digital signage, different angles. I mean, we're just trying to do things uh, to recover. Uh, but it will get, I mean, if we were in this situation uh, next season with no fans, uh, and we're already anticipating, and we don't know what's going to happen. We have no idea. But we are having sessions just internally saying, what's our revenue source? This is where you start to think differently. And this is where innovation kicks in. This is where creativity thinks in, kicks in. And what I'm telling our team is, it's time to re reimagine basketball. Our number one goal in our organization was to increase viewership over this season. So now we are forced to increase viewership. And we have. More eyeballs are on our games now than ever before. How do we monetize that and take advantage of it? So those are all the conversations going on right now. But it's, it's a very, very real issue. Knock on wood, we haven't laid anybody off. It's great. Uh, we've, got, we've got questions going on our screens from some of our participants, so I'd love to throw one out to you. Uh, awesome. I think I got about five more minutes because then I have a board of governors call to attend. Oh, okay. As, well, before women, that, as, as one of the few women, yeah. I like to show up. <laughs> you got to be there. Allie, maybe you'll take it. You want to take it to Robin? Okay. She's now on screen, but off audio. This is hysterical. I will let, I will let Robin in. Okay. Oh, let's, yeah. yeah. Allie's back. We have a special, a special question from a special viewer. Robin! Hi, Sid! <laughs> How are you? Thank you from the... How you doing? Hi, sister. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Kelly's here next to me. I wish you could <laughs> see, see her, but she's seen you. And I love Kelly. I love Kelly. Oh, Kelly Robinson is a rock star. Robin is amazing, okay? Kelly is amazing, so she got it from her mother. Kelly is working on something we have not even rolled out yet, so you'll be the first. I will tell, we are going to launch this amazing girls initiative next season for the Mavs. It is going to be incredible. Kelly has been working on that uh, for months. She made a presentation a few weeks ago, and I just had my mouth open. I was almost speechless. We are getting ready to take over girls sports. So anyway, I love you, Robin. Love you, Kelly. Thank you, Sim. Thank you, Sim, for doing this. I love you. Miss you. Hope we love you all get together soon. But my mom's got a question for you. <laughs> all right, dear. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so you are incredible. I, I wanted to share a quick little story. Kelly said no, but I have to because you really do know your people so very well. When I first met Scent, it was at a women's symposium very similar to what we normally do. And um, I walked up to you afterwards for a little meet and greet to say hello. I started to introduce myself and Scent has this most curious look on her face. And I have never met her before. She doesn't know who I am because I'm not wearing a name tag. And she just looks at me and she goes, do you work for the Mavericks? And I'm like, no, but my daughter does. And it was because I was wearing an employee only jacket that Kelly had given me that day to wear to the game. So she does know her people. So I have a question for you. I thought I had missed somebody. I'm like, I'm losing it. What? <laughs> <laughs> I know. It was so cute. So genuine. You very are. You are so genuine and authentic. I love everything about you and your energy. So I'm wondering, how have you been able to maintain connectivity and still do your dynamic and amazing job here in the Mavs organization during this crazy time? Well, you know what? It's because of people like your daughter. Honestly, uh, very early on, we just kicked in and said, okay, we're not playing the, the game of basketball now, but we are playing the game of life with people. So what are the things that we need to do for our folks and for the community? And so they came up with all these ways. I mean, we have our weekly huddles, uh, the whole organization. We get together on Wednesday. We started every other Wednesday during the summer uh, months so people could you know, take some time off. Uh, but we have kind of our meditation time together on Tuesday mornings. I mean, they have all these activities that we do as an organization every 
week. And then, of course, I have my Friday letter called, you know, my uh, my two cents, uh, where I, I reach out to everybody. We have uh, counselors come in and focus on mental health. Uh, we just have this, uh, you know, I kicked into to something. Uh, I call it my new dot com, my new leadership platform. Uh, it was just I, I thought one day, what am I what am I supposed to be doing right now? Everything has changed. And I figured it was about compassion, communication, like it had to be at an all time high now, uh, compromise, um, compliance and community. And so those are the five things we've been focused on. And the community piece is keeping us connected. We're doing all this community stuff together, even socially distant. Uh, we, we're, we're doing it together. So uh, they came up with it, and I'm just kind of helping to execute on it. They know what to do. They know how to keep us connected. Kelly's been all in the middle of it. It's been fabulous. We're closer now. Honestly, we have more communication now because of COVID than prior, because some things that we did monthly – now we do weekly. I mean, because we, we're just trying to over rotate on keeping people together for a few reasons, because we're not in the office being able to run in, you know, run into each other and handle stuff. So we want to make sure everybody's connected. But I'm also very, very focused on that end part of PMS, the mental piece of it, and making sure people aren't getting isolated. And I end every weekly letter by saying, if you're feeling isolated, reach out, blah, 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 because that's very, uh, that's very important. Thank you. Right. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear uh, me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. So I am so sorry that we're not able to take any more questions. So I know everyone wants to, we just want all of your time spent. Can't you just stay all day? Well, but yeah, I mean, I'm you can take a couple of more if you want to. I got time for a couple of more. You got a, a time for a couple more? Yeah, I okay. still got what, a few minutes. I'm all right. There's a few one minute. There's one from one of our viewers. Uh, it's a quick one. They asked if you shared your faith with um, Cuban and how, yes. was, how did he respond to it? Yes. You when I told him I had to pray about it, he said, OK, well, I'm not a religious guy. I said, I'm not either, but I'm a spiritual person. I said, let me make it real clear to you right now. If you ever tell me to do something and the Lord tells me to do something else, I'm going with him. I got a prayer closet. I take everything into my prayer closet and it, it takes him to talk about it. He said, I start preaching in his office. Yeah. Um, and so I take I take the Lord with me everywhere I go. I, I, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed. No. It's who I am. I, no, just don't even. I'll start preaching right now. <laughs> <laughs> Ali, did you have any? I saw another one that said, "To what extent are you interacting with the players? And if you are, as the CEO, what are you saying when you do interact with them?" Well, here in the bubble, I won't be able to see them. They'll keep us apart. So that'll be kind of hard for me tonight. I guess I can just wave. Uh, but normally I do. I, I do talk to them. And we have our normal uh, training kind of stuff, respecting the workplace, all that. And I actually personally do that with our ethics uh, person. Uh, but I spend time with them. I talk to them. Uh, Sometimes they'll just text me because they just want, I mean, they, you know, they're, they're young. I'm 60 years old. So I got so much advice for them just in life. And a lot of them take advantage of that. But we work the business side of basketball. So when we need them to participate in the community, they're talking to our team a lot. And then they'll, they'll, they'll call me or if I'm doing an event with them. Uh, so we have a lot of interaction with them and the coaches. Yeah. Okay, I've got a quick one. I just got texted to me. They asked, would you please pose for a picture right now? I'll do it right now, and then I'll leave. I'll do it right now. Let's pose. Hold on, hold on. Let me get my lips on. Wait, you know, you know, you got to have. I gotta have my lips on. <laughs> Don't play. I gotta look good. I can't show up in some picture looking hey, good. Allie, Allie and Joan, it's Aaron. If y'all will gather all the questions that didn't get answered, I have an idea of how we can get them answered and back out to y'all. So, I'll do my best. But just that if you collect them, then we'll work on it. That would be great. Awesome. Okay. Okay. All right. Got it. Got it? Cool. <laughs> I love y'all. Okay. Yes. Okay, everyone, with that, we are going to wrap this up. I hope you heard from Scent these three things. So the first is know your crystal balls from your rubber balls and know what's worth your time and your attention and what's okay to miss. The second is the difference between diversity and inclusion. So don't just invite women or maybe the next generation of leaders to the table. Make them feel included. Let them know what the rules are. Maybe have a talk before or after or, or softball some questions to them. And the third is it's easy to make decisions if you know what your values are. So set your values. Take some time. Set it aside. You saw Sint had 
so many values on her screen, identify what your most important ones are and live towards that act. We can all, if you remember the four things that Scent lives by, we can all live by this. Dream, focus, pray, and act. So Scent's already gone, but Scent and Erin and the entire Mavs team, thank you for letting us have an hour and a half of her time on behalf of the BIA of Orange County, Joan, Robin, Kelly, myself, everyone on this call, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, for all of the BIA members, thank you for joining us. I hope you guys stay safe, stay sane, stay healthy, and we really hope that we're going to be together at the Grove next year, being able to do this again. Signing off for now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Allie. Mwah.